I'm sure you've seen the photos. I'm sure you've seen the videos. But what if there was a direct account of someone who has gone through that kind of hell and can tell you exactly what it was like firsthand? Azov style steel plant is one place on earth where the steel bended under fire of missiles. But the people were tougher than that. They persevered. One of these tougher than steel warriors, call name Torque, is going to tell you his story in this interview. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on all of your notifications so you can get notified when the next part of this interview comes out. Without further ado, Torque. Warning, this video contains gore pertaining to warfare that might be triggering to some. Proceed with caution. Let's um talk about February 24th. You and your unit were stationed in defense of Mariupol. Where exactly in the city were you? What was um the goal, so to speak, of your unit? How many of you were there? And um, what was happening around you at that time? So, I'll say it this way. Our base is in Mariupol anyway, and in two neighboring towns about a 20-kilometer range away. Uh... I was on leave in the city itself. Well, I was on my way to the city, so I didn't go back to the base. I just texted my brothers in arms and asked them to bring all of my equipment, my uniform, my weapon, the deal. That's it. We were based in a specific location that was assigned to us and settled there as we waited for instructions on our objectives. Uh, at that time, Russian forces were coming in from Crimea towards Kherson, Novokhovka, uh, so predominantly through southern Ukraine towards Mariupol. In the northern part of the city, we had a front set up since 2014. At that time, they started shelling the outskirts of the city in the northern part. So, in the beginning, uh, our main goal was to cruise around the city and detect diversionists, separatists, uh, etc. That was that, and then ultimately, when the enemy entered the city from all sides, we moved on to combat, a full-fledged urban warfare. So your initial objective was to defend the city, and then if anything happens, wait for instructions? Well, yes and no. Our objective, in general, was to defend Mariupol, to not give it up, and we weren't going to leave it. Redis, for instance, recorded an address to the Ukrainian people saying Azov isn't going to leave Mariupol no matter what. Uh, then we were going to stand until the last man. And that's factually what we did. No one left, no one deserted. So we held the defense, fulfilling our objective, uh, fulfilling the order. How did it all start for you? Like, where were you, as in when the war started? Uh, so, yeah, the first thing that happened was rockets started flying. The missiles started flying through APS in Ukraine as a whole, not just Mariupol. And it was all over Ukraine. Uh, yeah, so about when rockets flooded in, artillery started shelling the outskirts of my city. And you could really hear all of that all over when it landed. As I said, five in the morning. I'm getting ready, I get into a taxi, then I head to the spot that I was assigned. I get there, I wait for my guys to bring all my gear from the base, Everyone was ready, everyone was waiting, everyone knew. Everyone knew that it's about to happen. Uh, everyone had their gear packed, so we just met up in the city. Could you and your unit have ever imagined what was waiting for you ahead? As in, what did you think was going to be your combat objective and how all of this was going to unfold for you? Well, we really didn't expect such fast advances from the South at the minimum. As in, it's the South, it's... Well, after the war, there's going to be a lot of questions about that, as in to the command on a government level. And all of that needs to be investigated, because really, they just came in from there with no resistance and encircled us. And as to the northern part, of course we understood that there was going to be heavy combat from the very beginning. One other thing we didn't expect is shelling all of the random places in the city, civilian infrastructure. I really honestly don't get why. At some point, we thought maybe there 
going to run out of ammo, but it was literally infinite. It's Russia. It's not some pseudo-republics that still keep warehouses of Ukrainian ammo. No, no. That was infinite. It had uninterrupted resupply from different directions, but we'd expected all that. Potentially, sure. Everything was possible. Uh, I think one thing to point out, the most unpleasant one, was the warship at the shore that kept consistent fire and 24-7 airplane strikes. Uh, the planes were flying, one left, another one came in. Um, and it was like that 24-7, airplanes flying, dropping bombs. So throughout the entire time in Mariupol, there wasn't a single moment where something wasn't falling? No, of course not. Just 24-7? Yeah, of course. Rockets, planes, well, I mean rockets and bombs. And I'm not even going to get into the topic of artillery. It was a norm. So I have a question. When you were holding the defense of the city, people often say that you did it with your bare hands. Well, obviously not, but... Yeah, I'll explain. I got it. We had very limited resources because the city was surrounded. In general, the garrison of Mariupol was surrounded. Uh, We didn't have resupply. So the logistics didn't work in that arena. So we were holding our ground with what we had. Artillery ran out as in mm, the barrels of the weapons could not shoot ammo anymore. At any enemy fire points, and our artillery and our tankers transitioned into infantry. So basically you have a tank and you have two light RPGs, and you have a tank in front of you, So there's a 97% chance that these RPGs aren't even going to dent it. So that's it. You're standing there waiting for some marine reinforcements to enter a quasi-even-leveled battle. As to the quantity of us to them, 1 to 14, so I'm not even going to go there. Yeah, so in terms of quantity, we weren't doing well either. So it's just you with an automatic weapon against a tank. Yeah, not just one tank, though. The guys from the anti-tank regiment, it's specifically an anti-tank unit. They would destroy a tank, another tank. You go to a new location, and you go to your next location, and your walkie-talkie update says there are three new tanks that just came in. And, And it's infinitely like that. So you breathe in, and you think to yourself, ah, minus three tanks today. But factually, they just keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying through the Crimean Channel, and that supply easily entered the city and wasn't countered at all. Just an infinite chain. Yeah, yeah, I mean, our task was just literally to hold on. The front kept coming closer and closer, and the radius of defense just kept shrinking and shrinking and, well, it shrunk. So at that point, the objective wasn't to defend the city anymore, but rather to just survive? No, no, no. The defense was very strong for a very long time. Everything was good. With time, obviously, we've located some weaknesses in some directions. Uh, For instance, in the aviation department. We didn't have any resistance. We didn't have any APS, and therefore an airplane felt right at home. And so, slowly but surely, they kept pushing. And you also got to understand that we, for instance, had our marine units, our anti-tank units, and some sort of mortar somewhere, maybe one or two. Our enemy had 155 millimeter artillery, tank, and all of that I can say in safely unlimited quantities. And so they could afford to do anything. We had to get very creative in order to somehow slow them down. There wasn't anything like surviving. (laughs) Survive maybe became a thing in Azovstal when everybody was cooped up there, but urban warfare was full-fledged defense. Because outside of just defending yourself, you had to quite literally handhold civilians through it. The people who had it worst, they couldn't understand why they were being fired at. We would literally be passing by and see a burning house, and some old lady runs out of it in tears screaming, Why are they shilling us? Uh, What are we supposed to say to her? Because it's the Russian world, the same Russian world that is leveling the city to the ground as we speak? So we had to take such ladies, find some basement to drop them into so they could safely stay alive at least. So besides your job, you also have to waste, um, well not waste, but spend valuable time and physical resources on that, and sleep, food. 
I'm not even going to get into that. Those didn't exist in Mariupol. So, how did you end up in Azovstal? You don't have to give me like an exact date or anything if you don't remember, but just generally. Of course I do. I mean, I remember, yeah, all the days blended into one, but specifically the situation with Azovstal. Uh, I got wounded on 12th of April. I got uh, blown up by a grenade. I was down for three days. At that point, the city was divided into two defense sectors, one in Azovstal, uh, which after the enemy separated us from Azovstal and pressing in on us. So they surrounded Azovstal and completely separated us into two defense sectors. We didn't have any contact with Azovstal besides walkie-talkies, and our sector was collapsing in on us. The inner city sector, our defense radius was shrinking in on us, so three days after I got wounded, I was told there was an order to break through in their rear, uh, their positions. You can even say through the deep rear of the enemy. So you basically got to get courage and drive through the Russians. Uh huh. So to paint a clearer picture here, would this be the same point in time when the 36th Marine Brigade was supposed to meet Azov? Uh, yes. The 36th Brigade turned out a bit different. Their mission was get to Azovstal with all personnel, uh, to merge with Azov with their full unit. They were supposed to come towards us, our sector that was heading to Azovstal, to help us create a corridor so we would be able to break through and hold a stronger defense in Azovstal. Uh, where we'd wait for some shift in the battle, as in with the rest of the garrison, to see what comes next and what our government can negotiate. The 36th Brigade and its majority decided to do something different. To go against orders, so to speak. Uh, meanwhile, the commander of their battalion, uh, call sign Vilna, if I'm not mistaken, and the 180 people with him followed through to Azovstal according to the order and settled in with us, or rather fell under the command of Redis, became their direct commander. And it's just 180 people. It was supposed to be 1,200 people. I mean, it's obvious that you cannot create a corridor with only 180 people. So we weren't fully stranded. We had some guys meeting us. But factually, we had to quite literally break through to Azovstal. Uh, first and foremost, to get medical attention for all of our wounded, because the conditions we were in prior did not allow for any surgical intervention. So we had to get through to Azovstal. Understood. So what was your personal journey to Azovstal like? You said you had a serious injury. Um, I had four or five bone breaks, an open break of my shin, a part of my calf muscle was torn out. <laughs> How can I visualize this for you? Uh, actually, wait a second. So I was blown up on my left leg. Muscles were torn out and nerves and arteries were damaged. You know, standard stuff. Some bones were broken. You know what um, uh, really amazes me? How all of you, I mean, all the guys I've seen interviews with, you talk about your injuries, and I mean brutal injuries, like... Here, look. Oh? This is day 10. My god. I have a little hole in my leg. Uh, we had some jokes about it when we were at Azovstal already. Uh, when we were rebandaging, we would put on gloves and touch the bone with our fingers, because we were curious what it felt like. Yeah, so I was pretty much immobile on my own. I uh, couldn't jump, so to speak. My leg was being squeezed in a tourniquet and bandages. The wound was tamponaded uh, as well, but given the circumstances, there wasn't really a whole heck of a lot that we could really do to stop the bleeding. That was still in Mariupol, not Azovstal, right? Yeah, that was my sector in the city where I was stationed. Uh, that's where I received first aid from the medics. They tamponaded as best they could. I had nine, ten shrapnel wounds, and the big one. I was tamponaded and had a tourniquet, and it was still bleeding out. Uh, they gave me a choice. The first day it happened, uh, they couldn't do much, so they gave me a choice. Wait and see if something changes, and I could be airlifted out of the encirclement, uh, which at that point was incredibly unlikely, as some copters were shot down. The option was, uh, you'll get evacuated. So that was an 
option, but a so-so option, and I shoved it aside. Or try and get to Azovstal, where surgeons can help you in a proper manner. Uh, option three, we have Nelbafine and an hex, so we can chop your leg off, and there is a chance we can patch up the leg so you at least won't bleed out. To avoid a blood infection, otherwise we have to wait and see what happens. So I thought, let's wait two or three days. I mean, I understand I was a burden. That's it. I'm useless at that point. So I was down for three days already under painkillers, and my leg was bleeding constantly. And that's right when we got an order to break through to Azovstal. So I thought, all right, we're going to get to Azovstal, and someone's going to be able to do something. <laughs> well, my journey... It was nighttime, I think like uh, midnight or 1 a.m. We were supposed to be loaded into one car, into a uh, Kraz. It's like a cargo car. I think that's the easiest way I can explain it. Uh, one of those cars didn't have any space for me. Everyone there was bedridden, so I was taken to another car, and everyone there could still sit up despite their injuries, but no space for me there either. Uh, those two cars later got shelled, and everyone in them died. All injured guys. A literal truckload of people. I don't know, maybe 80 people altogether. Yeah, so uh, all of them died. And at the end of the day, I was put in a completely different car. Uh, the column started moving. We had some people walking and some people in the cars. Uh, we were moving, moving, moving. And then the shelling started. Uh, grads, artillery, you name it. Everything was coming at us. We got held up in a hole in the road, uh, presumably a crater formed from an explosion. The driver yelled out to leave the car. Uh, as I said earlier, I couldn't necessarily jump. It hurt a whole lot. My leg was broken, my shin, the heel, the bottom of my entire foot. So any minor vibrations, like say the car ride, hurt a lot. Uh, I had to hold on to my leg to give it at least some amortization. So I was helped out of the car, I was standing there and looked around. Saw the column moving by me and think, well, what do I do from here? I was like, maybe I should lay low and then crawl. But I didn't even understand where I was. It's nighttime, pitch black. So I see an APC coming by and I just clutch onto it. And we were moving towards the steel plant. We got into some bushy terrain and at that time my leg looked like this. So this is my shin and this is the bottom of my foot. And so in this part, my leg broke that way again. We were driving through some branches because my leg was already pointing sideways. It got hit by a branch and <laughs> broke again. But by a branch? Yeah, well, midway through my shin, my leg just started pointing sideways. It formed into an L letter shape. Well, I mean, what are you going to do? Just roll with it. Yeah, it hurts, but you got to persevere. So I held on. We were moving, 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 and then it felt like, I reckon we're falling down. I was lucky. I was on the right wing of the car because those who were on the left, well, they weren't so lucky. The car turned over, we fell from the bridge into the water. I got like super lightly hit into the APC, maybe. As we were in the water, someone was trying to clutch onto my leg, and just to illustrate, they weren't grabbing it like this way, but this way. So they were trying to grab it like a monkey bar, and by the way, I don't swim well. Actually, I'm very bad at it. I honestly don't know how I floated out. I had a level 7 PCU on, and that's a term that people in America who are somewhat connected to the military will know. The American level 7 PCU is like this gray jacket that can, can't get wet under any circumstance. If it does, it gets incredibly heavy. So I don't know how I was able to float out while wearing it. I had a boot on one of my feet, the other one was bare, the one with the tourniquet and bandages. Uh, so I floated out and hid under a bridge. For the next two and a half hours, the bridge was shelled non-stop. It was a hot spot. It basically turned into a graveyard where lots of cars were falling down and lots of guys were dying. It was very heavy shelling, so I was there for about two and a half hours and I thought, well, we're going to freeze to death or I'm going to bleed out. The options are slim here. It's April, April 15th. Uh, it's very cold. Especially when you're wet at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. I don't know. So I decided to crawl to Azovstal but crawl, but really couldn't. Before I could even attempt to, I had to pop my leg back into place. Uh, but by yourself? 
Well, who else? Who was, was there to help me? Well, you shed a tear for a second and I did it. Uh, I mean, I mean, I understand that the question is a little silly, but I, I mean, I'm shocked. I generally am shocked that you can talk about it so easily. Like, it's just a story. I mean, actually, one of the reasons I wanted to speak specifically with you after I watched a bunch of interviews was because I was very taken aback. You have this trait. You can talk about incredibly serious things. I don't even know how to, like, describe it in Russian, but in the U.S. we call it happy-go-lucky. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Uh, it's just, it's just because when, I'll jump ahead a little bit here. When I got to Azovstal, I found out the guys had buried me five times already. Some thought I was blown up in those original two cars, my unit specifically. I wasn't traveling with them, but other people where there was space. So my unit thought that I was in that cargo car, and as they were moving along, they saw that the car was hit. They saw the bodies falling out. And so they thought, oh, that's it, torque's gone. Then they were told uh, that I was loaded into another car, and that one they saw was hit with an ATG missile, and so again, that's it, Torque died. And then some guy said, well, no, I saw him clutch onto an APC, but he couldn't be sure because it was dark, so me, not me, no one could tell. So someone kind of maybe saw me there. So then I told them that I was under the bridge, and uh, there was sniper shot. Oh, what a cute Frenchie! She's, um, going a little crazy today. <laughs> oh, really? We just actually got our dog back from Mariupol, too. A couple days ago. Maybe a week. And so, uh, wait, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, under the bridge. So, two guys from AFU were shot by a sniper, and I, for some reason, wasn't. Literally, just a moment of luck. And later, when I was crawling to Azovstal, there were rockets flying, and somehow I managed to get to the bunker. So yeah, my guys buried me five times already, but somehow I survived. And after that, to be super down, to cry because of memories, no. I'm only sad about the guy, only those I knew from the very beginning. That makes sense for something like that to make me sad. But being sad about how I survived, well, that makes no sense. And the circumstances under which I survived, well, I'm alive, all good. Well, yeah, it's pretty understandable. I mean, on the one hand, I understand the logic here. I'm a pretty rational person myself. You've gone through a lot of horror, but at the end of the day, you're sitting here in front of me. Everything is okay. You're in rehab. So in the grand scheme, everything is pretty fine. You're going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. So, ultimately, that's not necessarily the only thing that matters, but roughly speaking, you have something to be happy about. And, of course, you ha also have a lot of things to think about in horror, but ultimately, life goes on, right? Yeah, you've got to push off of what you have. Yeah, you practically have two options here. You can live your life through the lens of all the awful stuff that happened, and you can mentally destroy yourself. Or you can keep keeping on and yeah, evolve. Yeah, of course. Sure thing. Where was I? You were at the fact that a lot of your friends... No, no, I meant before that, uh, speaking on the story itself. Ah, yeah, so, I was waiting for the shelling to stop when I was under the bridge. I saw that artillery slowed down. It's obvious that a weapon aimed at one spot can't keep going endlessly. It gets overheated. It's standard practice, and no matter how many of them there are, they all need a break at some point. And they get swapped for, let's say, infantry. So the artillery slowed down a little, they moved on to grenade launchers, uh, AGS, so lower calibers. So I figured that's it, I gotta move, and <laughs> your dog can't relax, can she? Nope, never. <laughs> yeah, so I started moving forward, crawling to the territory as Azovstal. So my bandages at that point, well, I want to point out that our first aid kit, compared to the first aid kit of our enemy, and our medical training in general follow the TCC system. And that's an American system that the American army follows. Well, it's the bomb, because it saved many lives, mine among those. You do everything according to an algorithm, and you have everything written out for you, so to speak, in terms of what your actions should be. This system, it's essentially a how-to on tourniquets? Yeah, it's an algorithm. 
during the Vietnam War, when the U.S. was in combat, they figured out what was the source of most deaths, which is first and foremost blood loss in bigger percentages. And so they came up with an algorithm of what to do. First and foremost, you check yourself or someone who's injured for blood loss, and then you see whether they can uh, breathe or not, broken bones and whatnot in a specific order. And thanks to that, a lot of guys remained alive as a rule. How far away were you from Azovstal when that um, APC um, fell? Not very far from the plant itself, but the spot I needed to get to, about 2.5 kilometers away. It's just that Azovstal was about 100 meters away, and there was supposed to be a concrete wall, but obviously it wasn't there anymore. You know, lots of bombs and all. You just had to crawl over the ruins and hope you don't get taken out by a sniper or hit by shrapnel. You just had to crawl and hope. And crawl in my case meant that all my bandages got loose. Tourniquet is useless because of water. Everything is wet. My leg is bleeding out. I'm mad cold. <laughs> Seventh layer had to be lost. I'm in a fleece and pants and in one boot. Isn't a tourniquet only good for two hours? Well, my tourniquet, I had to keep loosening it. I mean, at that moment, not anymore. It was super tight and it held on. I don't know how my leg became functional, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll get back to that. We're going to touch on that moment with the tourniquet. Uh, so basically I had the tourniquet for three days, but we kept adjusting it. I had some blood infusions, uh, some liquid infusions to compensate for the blood loss. And that's how I was kept stable these three days to remain alive. And by the way, I even have the tourniquet with me now in my civilian life everywhere. <laughs> Just in case then? Well, yeah, I mean, can save someone life. Uh, you know, <laughs> never know. I just hope it won't be my own again. <laughs> oh, well, I hope everything is only going to go up from here for you. Well, so the tourniquet and everything started getting uh, really loose. And I was starting to understand that most likely I'm going to bleed out now. I was loopy. My energy was low. It was getting harder. I was crawling to the best of my ability. Some rockets were landing nearby, not into me specifically, but into buildings I was crawling by. I, due to simple blind luck, didn't get hit by shrapnel or secondary blasts like stone or rocks. I was crawling under an awning at some point, and everything landed on top of it. That awning was two meters in diameter at most, and I just happened to be there in the moment. Uh, next up, I was crawling between some concrete blocks, and I started losing it. So I laid down for a second, uh, hoping for a second wind to kick in to crawl on. I had only the uh, understanding of the general azimuth of where to go. Um, then I saw some guys that were running towards there. I told them to run away as I've been laying and seeing lots of Orlins flying above us. And they're going to see us and artillery will start going at us again. Or we're going to get hit by grenade launchers. They said, no dude, we're going to save you, we'll come back. Wait five to ten minutes. It's a motivational moment for me. I think to myself, okay, cool, I gotta live. I'm looking at the time, it's been five, ten, fifteen, twenty minutes, and I'm like, all right, well, no one is coming back for me, and I see them speeding toward me with a makeshift stretcher, and there are four of them now, or maybe three. They found some more dudes somewhere, they're running to me. Well, we promised we'd come back for you. They put me on the stretcher, and we set off in short runs. Artillery was heavy, so they're carrying me and something hits nearby. This is what you got to understand here. It's a metallurgical plant destroyed by bombs. So all that metal, all those ruins, it's all under your feet. Just a grinder. It's wild chaos. We had to hop over some wild stuff, some warehouses, and you would think the distance was not large, but there was no straight path. And so with these short runs, we managed to make it to an evac. I was loaded in there, and in that vehicle, I was transported into the medical bunker. And it's specifically the bunker with all the 300s. And that's it. Uh, there I... And those guys that came back for you, they weren't from your unit, were they? No, those guys were from the National Guard as a whole. Uh, they were on the territory of the plant from the very beginning, and it was their task at this time. So it was National Guard. I don't know which unit. I only remember one guy's face. Uh, we'll meet one day. I hope he gets exchanged soon. 
Yes, uh, National Guard. Those weren't our regiment guys. Uh, they had a specific task to help those breaking through into the plant. They basically had to collect us if we needed help and bring us to the evac, which then would take us to the bunker. So I got to the bunker. As I'm being carried, I see some faces from my unit that managed to get there. And they thank God I managed to get there with no issues. Smooth ride. Their eyes were bulging like, Oh my God, Torque, you're alive. How? How did you manage? We saw all these cars getting blown to shreds. Ultimately, I was brought into the OR. Originally, they were going to amputate my leg, and I understood that. I was ready for it. All good. I'm thinking to myself, Oh my gosh, just cut it off. I'll be able to sleep like a person. And then a medic runs in and says, There's an order to save his leg. So they started on shrapnel picking, tamponading. Well, ultimately the leg was warm and functional, let's say that. So I was shaking, not from fear, not like that, I was frozen. Well, your body was giving up on you pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I was being operated on. I was shot up into my spine to numb everything below the belt, specifically my legs. And in my legs, I somehow felt warm, but my body was shaking from the cold, so the medics were holding me down and operating on my leg. At that time, there was still anesthetic at Azovstal? Yeah, yeah. At the time, of course, we still had it. Uh, pretty much the bunker was functioning quite well, so to speak. The one with the wounded. Yeah. And then I was placed in a bed and saw what was around me. People were factually laying on top of each other. You've seen the photos. It's not a joke. People were quite literally laying on top of each other in three layers. One right near the other. Two people in one bed sometimes. The sanitary commissions, we're not even going to get into that. It's a bunker. It's quite evident what the circumstance is. So the medics were doing what they could. They were trying to stretch the antiseptic, the antivirals. To somehow make it stretch over to more people. Because we really had a deficit of that. There wasn't any opportunity for humanitarian aid. The Russians weren't letting it through. They tried and negotiated, at least for the wounded, at least some bandaging materials. So we had to get creative on that front. You need a daily swap, and you would get it once in four days. Uh, because otherwise, it's just not going to last. And that's what our routine was like in Azovstal in a bunker. At first, the food portions were like, I mean, a little plastic plate, a little bit of soupy soup, uh, and that's when we still had an opportunity to cook in the bunker. There was a separate little room for a kitchen, and we had cooks. Ultimately, a rocket landed there, and the kitchen was no more. And so we had to get food from another bunker. And the problem was that every time these guys had to go get food, they were risking their lives. I have so much respect for those guys, because they were running with buckets on their backs for 300 people with food. And that food was a little plastic glass, well, actually here, hold on, I have one. Uh, this is just a regular plastic glass, and we had about this much porridge and a piece of lard. And that was your daily ration, and you have to eat it, because, let's say, if you don't like porridge, you look at it, you smile. You give it to your neighbor, and then you wait until the next day. And in the morning, you smile, you're alive. You weren't hit by a metal plate, and you wait for food. And that was your every day. Because when I got there, the bunker was in one piece, pretty much. And I was able to see everything. There were guys, I mean, wounded and they're bedridden. The first bomb landed and killed two people under the rubble. Yeah, they died. The second bomb landed and killed three people, and one guy had the nose of the bomb, it, like, stuck in his stomach. It literally went through him. We were lucky. The bomb exploded in the ceiling, not inside the bunker. If it had blown up inside the bunker, it most likely would have been much worse, and we would have had way more losses. The bomb, the one that exploded in the ceiling, is that by any chance from Orist's photograph where a soldier is standing in a beam of light? No, 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 no. That uh, photo is taken from some random warehouse. Absolutely not the same thing. We were literally in a bunker, so like an attic but with an open sky now. And that photo, it's a warehouse, a metallurgical warehouse, and it's above ground. 
See, one of the most difficult things is understanding the geography of everything that was going on in Azovstal. It's better not to understand or imagine it. it it's not a peachy subject. Well, might not be peachy, but you know, I still oh, think yeah, that... Yeah, you gotta understand. Yeah, to some degree you should. And see posts online from people that say, oh, if you can't handle a Zoom, then you shouldn't open your social media when they take Mariupol back. And I think it's so wrong because, you know, you gotta open your social media. Well, of course, you gotta know. Of course you gotta know. It's history. This is where we come back to the same Nazism. I mean, there is the standard practice, and we're not going into the Geneva Convention. It's just a simple notion of humanity. They, well, here's a situation specifically from my life. They have birds flying 24-7, so anyone who goes above ground gets shelled immediately. So obviously we understand that they have an infinite supply of drones. They keep cruising around. They're able to stay in the air for long periods of time. The reason why I bring it up is because they see who is running to the bunker. It's usually wounded, fallen. To then put in a body bag and move them to a different bunker or to preserve or into a refrigerator. Depending on the situation. They see that these are not combat capable units. It's not Kai's coming out to take their positions. They fully understand it's a bunker with wounded. They see no difference. They send bombs, they send ammo of all different calibers. There is nothing more that needs to be said. These are wounded. These are not combat capable anymore. They're not going to be giving any resistance. They're already consuming resources. They need more food. Well, in our case, need, but can't have. And to the point of food, we can come back to it later too, because there were all sorts of mass media spreading videos and such that we had caviar, condensed milk, loads of water. Yeah, it was there in a hangar. We all knew about that hangar. And then there was a bomb that hit it, and now it's rubble. And that's it. It was above ground, and all that food, you can even see it in the media, it was above ground. And the point is, you couldn't get them either way because there's always a drone cruising around. If you try to get anywhere, that's it. You're 200. So the second you get above ground, you get noticed, that's it, and you're done? Yeah, right away. I'm not even exaggerating. An AGL hits you right away. Every bunker was a specific target, and the weapons were adjusted accordingly. So they see someone, they get an order, they press a button. And weapons issues, they had none. Endless supply. So wherever you ended up in the plant, that's where you will be till the end, and you can't leave. Yeah, that or just luck. I think in this war in general, a major percentage of survival is attributed to luck. Just blind luck. I feel like in all situations like that, luck is an important thing as, you know, they don't choose who and why. It just depends on where you are at a specific moment in time. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, your skill plays an important part, but that's in battle. And while under aviation or artillery fire, you're just left with luck. One of the things that I thought about was, wow, you are one of the luckiest guys alive. The amount of times Torque defied all odds is incredible. Me and my dog over here, who really likes interrupting this interview, want to remind you that Torque's PayPal is still up and we're still collecting funds to be able to provide an apartment for his parents. So if you'd like to join that initiative, please do so. His PayPal link is down in the description of this video and it's also right here on the screen. And on that note, I will see you next week. And next on the docket is his journey through the Russian captivity, where he's going to tell us some things that Russians have asked of him, what they thought about his tattoos, because as we might have seen, tattoos he doesn't lack. And, uh, He'll tell you all about how it was to come back home.